everyone. I'm going to give us a few seconds to uh, get everyone in attendance, let everyone log in. Uh, so I'll go through some quick housekeeping first. My name is Lizzie Hoffman. I'm the marketing manager at Tower Data, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Email Deliverability 101, Tips, Tools, and tech Techniques to Reach the Inbox. So today we have Matt Wallace, the VP of Sales here at Tower Data. And then our guest is Mike Donnelly. He's the CEO at Seventh Sense. So a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask them throughout. There's a dedicated question and answer time at the end of the webinar. However, if we see something, we may see something compelling, we may answer it during the webinar. But if it doesn't get answered during, no worries, we can answer it at the end. And if we don't get to it at the end, we'll follow up with you individually. Additionally, there aren't any polls for this conversation, but there are some handouts. So if you want to access those at any point in time, we may reference them. Feel free to do so. Otherwise, this is recorded. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and we'll send you the full recorded session in the next day or so. Uh, so that way you have that to go back and review. So now that housekeeping's done, I'm going to let Matt and Mike introduce themselves and we'll take it from there. Matt, why don't you uh, why don't you get us started, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll jump right in. Sure, thanks, Mike and uh, Lizzie. I appreciate everyone for jumping on. As Lizzie said, my name is uh, Matthew Wallage. I'm the uh, one of the VPs of Sales here at uh, Tower Data. Uh, essentially, we help our customers understand everything they need to know about the person associated with an email to market to them better. And um, we're here today to kind of talk about all the aspects of email deliverability from a sending and technical standpoint. And uh, Mike's been one of our partners for a while and looking forward for an opportunity to get into a, a deeper conversation with him here. Yeah, so uh, thanks everybody for joining. Lizzie for the introduction, Matt for your, your help in putting this together. I'm Mike Donnelly, I'm the CEO and co-founder of 7 Cents. We're in, you know, long and short of it, we're an email delivery optimization system that was designed really from the ground up to support uh, customers that are using either HubSpot or Marketo. Um, and so email deliverability is something that we talk about day in and, you know, day in and day out. And I feel like, you know, we've got 25 minutes. This is going to be an absolute lightning round of a, uh, of a, of a discussion because we could literally talk about this for hours and hours and hours. So I'm, I'm super glad we we're able to uh, put this together. Um, so Matt, like, Again, let's just kind of dive right in. Uh, reaching the inbox is getting harder and harder. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for that. One, this kind of thing did not happen overnight. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of marketers, and I'm sure, you know, when we've had discussions in the past, we talk about, you know, a lot of marketers and executives think, you know, hey, we don't have any kind of problem reaching the inbox. Our email marketing automation systems tell us that we have 99.9% .9 deliverability. Um, and my response always is, all that means is 99.9% .9 of your email didn't bounce. It, uh, it could have been received and then gone into quarantine. It could have gone into a spam folder. It could have gone into the promotions tab, the clutter folder. So again, this, didn't, this kind of conversation didn't happen overnight. Um, but I think more and more people are becoming aware of the challenges of ultimately reaching the inbox. And what I mean by it didn't happen overnight, if you think about years ago, everybody was talking about social, social, social. They were spending all of their budget on social advertising, PPC, collecting, you know, and amassing huge email lists. And then what they would do is they would, you know, that's the house they rented. But then the house they owned, which was their email list, they treated it as more or less a commodity. And executives be like, we need more leads. We need more webinar attendees. We need more of this. Let's just send more email. It doesn't cost us anything to send email. We've invested in HubSpot, Marketo, ActiveCampaign, you know, whatever marketing automation system it is. But where the real cost comes in is the cost of the recipients. And the likes of Google and Microsoft and corporate email systems started to really recognize this so started investing a lot of money into these types of artificial intelligence and filtering systems um so you know that that's kind of like just a high level overview or my take you know what, what's your take matt on, on on filtering systems and you know what you're experiencing in the marketplace uh from your side so mike i think it's a, a great starting point for this conversation so i feel there's kind of 
two mindsets and there's almost like a power struggle between them. You have the companies that have the opted in emails for prospecting customers, and then you have the mail providers, the Gmails, Microsoft, and the corporate mail providers of the world. And both are essentially saying, they're my customers, not yours. They're my customers, they're not yours. And in reality, if you are sending, I think we have to start looking at that, yes, they opted into my email list, they've shown interest in what I'm interested in, they probably want to receive my content, but it's really going to be up to the mail providers who are providing that email service to the end user who I'm trying to communicate with to set the ground rules, as frustrating as that seems, because you have the mail providers that look at it and say, if I'm Gmail or if I'm Hotmail, when that user is in their Gmail inbox or they're checking their Hotmail, they're in our world and they have to have a good user experience. Why? Because they made that grand bargain with us. Hey, free email, but we're going to use your activity in our platform to better serve ads to you and understand what you're doing and monetize you, right? Okay, free email, but we're going to monetize you as a user. And then when you look at the corporate side, you know, there's no ads in Outlook, but you're still paying a licensing fee uh, as a corporation. So that end company and their users want to have a good, clean experience and what they see in their inbox is often you know a reflection of the the mail provider and if they don't have a good relevant experience in their inbox you know that's when they start to get frustrated so i think as a sender it's an important mindset to have as much as they opted into us we still have to really to defer to the mail providers ground rules and understand really why they are setting those rules. Yeah, that, I mean, those are all incredibly interesting uh, perspectives uh, from, from kind of like both sides of it. And uh, I, I've never really thought about it that way where, um, yeah, it's, they've doubled up or they've opted into my list, but now I have to play by the ground rules of the, uh, of the actual email provider. Um, and so I think when we, really when we start to, think about ways of improving your ability to reach the inbox. You're right. We do have to play by some ground rules. Um, and, and, and some of those ground rules are really around like, you know, the first step is really to understand, you know, how does Google or how does Microsoft or how do corporate emails, you know, uh, filtering systems, how do they view me as a, as a sender, as a, as a marketer? Um, much like we have a credit score in our personal lives that determine how much is a bank going to lend us, or are they even going to lend us money? Uh, what are the terms under which they're going to lend to us? What marketers need to understand is the same thing is happening to you as a sender, where Google and Microsoft are building up a what they call a reputation about you to say, you know, are you inbox worthy? Are you promotions worthy? Are you clutter worthy? Are you more of a spammer? And I'm not talking about your professional spammers that are trying to steal your credit card information. I'm talking about, you know, marketers who just send a lot of email and don't pay attention to the signals that their recipients are leaving behind. Or are you, should we just quarantine your email altogether? Um, we see a lot of the quarantining uh, happening with corporate systems more than you would see like a Barracuda, et cetera, than you would with, uh, say a Google or a, a Microsoft. So really the first step in kind of like understanding what your more or less credit score is or your domain score is to, the, there's a number of tools that you can use to understand how these mailbox providers are viewing you. So Google, Google Postmaster Tools is personally my favorite because one, it's super easy to set up. Two, it's super easy to read. And Google provides not only a majority of personal email addresses, but also they probably now run 30 to 40% of all businesses worldwide, their emails. Um, they've taken a huge chunk out of, and there's 
Fortune 500 companies that now use Google as their email, you know, as their email business email provider. Um, so Google Postmaster Tools is definitely uh, the one at the top of my list. There's also a number of other tools. And if you are interested in exploring this more, just, you know, reach out to us. We'll, we'll certainly get you, you know, a full list. But uh, Sender Scores One, Ta Talos Intelligence, Reputation Authority, Barracuda Central, Trusted Source. So there's really this kind of even like micro economy around email deliverability and making sure that you have kind of a, a good domain reputation, uh, which will ultimately lead to your ability to reach people uh, in their, um, you know, in their inbox. And there's really, um, you know, so, so that's the first part is like, how do these mailbox providers view me? And then if I look at the second component is like, you know, what tools or techniques can I use to, to, to really reach the inbox? Um, one of them is an area that we focus in on, which is email delivery op optimization. What do I mean by that? It's, you know, who are you sending to and how often are you sending to them? Um, and when it comes to email delivery optimization, uh, much like companies invest tremendous amounts in search engine optimization, um, and why do they do that? Because they realize that when I do a Google search, I'm not going to go to the 10th page uh, of, a, of a search result to get my answer. I'm going to go to the first one, two, three, four, five. The first page is going to get most of the love. The same thing holds true when, you know, whether you're in your personal consumer life or your business life, you're not going to scroll past hundreds of emails to try and find an answer to something especially when marketers are marketing to you, you're gonna look for kind of the, the, those kind of top one, two, three emails that solve or address what you're looking for. Um, and so that's one of the things that email delivery optimization does is it allows you to send emails when the recipient is most likely to engage. Um, so another big part of this, and, and, and this is where uh, you know our partnership has been really strong is who cares who you send it to, um, how often you send it, uh, when you send it, if it's not really a valid email address. Um, so th this is really where, you know, again, our partnership started was around email validation tools. So Matt, why don't you like just share a little bit of, you know, what, what does email validation mean to you? Obviously you guys are the experts, but what, you know, share some insight there. Sure. So, Mike, I think a lot of things that you touched on are, are really important. And what I took from that just for getting into validation quick is that who you're sending to, if you listen and observe and analyze what their actions are on their emails, your tools are going to help essentially understand that. It's, it's not a secret. You know, the user's actions are going to tell you how to approach them and how to approach their list. So, you know, it, it's it's no big secret in terms of how we should be communicating with folks on our list. It's just a matter of like you're alluding to digging into that. So um, I think it's important to know that, hey, if you understand and have the tool to analyze what your users are saying, it, it does become pretty clear as you dig into it, not that we always want to accept what the users are telling us because they did opt in and we spend so much time and money getting their email, they should want to get it from us every single day, but that's not always the case. Um, you know, transitioning to email validation, it is really the first step and the easiest step to take. And it's really the first step in the process, right? Is when that user is opting into your list and on your site and on your form, you don't want to you know, stub your toe right at the beginning, right? So as soon as that user enters an email, we provide a solution to let you know right away, is that email valid or invalid? So if the email is invalid, we even have an option to alert that user to say, hey, there was a typo or misspelling, correct it before proceeding. We'll typically see anywhere from 10 to 15% of emails entered in on forms to be invalid. So if you can take that 10, 15% of potential bounces and make sure they don't get into your system, you're already at, at a much better starting point when you're sending your welcome emails. And this is before going downstream with all the tools that, that you know, Mike's saying. So we look at this as a really straightforward process. 
you know, the analogy I make all the time, if you're going to clean your house, don't let people walk in with their shoes, right? So cleaning your emails is just like taking your shoes off at the front door, right? And so as those users come in, make sure they're valid. And now they start getting into your, your marketing funnel. It's really the easiest step you're going to take in your whole process to make sure that your hard work downstream doesn't start to become compromised because you know we're all here because it's hard to get in the inbox right and all these little steps that we're going to talk about today from a, a technical standpoint and a validation standpoint all are going to have to come together and they all have a a really large perpetual return if you can tie them all together because we all know that email is really the most effective and the highest roi it's just not the easiest to to master because we all think, hey, I'm just pressing send and the person's opening and clicking. There's so many other dynamics to it that we're gonna gradually get into as the conversation moves along. But email validation on the front end is really the, the easiest step I think to take to make sure you get off to a good start. So Matt, I, I, I would love to actually unpack this to see if you have um, a little bit of data on the email validation side because th I see this as such a critical step that so many people miss, which which is the email validation step. Um, and, I, and I love the example of if you're going to clean your house, don't let people walk in with dirty shoes as soon as they walk into your house because immediately your house is going to be is going to be dirty. The same thing holds true with your 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 CRM. Your database is going to be just dirty from the from the get go. But um, and, and actually, to hear ten to fifteen percent of of email addresses just come in as invalid, that actually that number seems kind of low to me, um, given what I've seen of people fat fingering Gmail as gmail.com or they fat finger something. Um, but especially organizations, and I know you you do work quite a bit of work with uh, business to consumer type organizations, but like point of sale, um, mm -hmm. hey, when you go to you know either a restaurant or whatever it might be, especially when we get back to more and more normal uh, normalcy, you know, and, and and they're all trying to get into you know digital advertising because it's just much more cost effective and they ask for your email address. I mean, that those point of sale things where you're just actually writing your email address or fat fingering it on an iPad, I would imagine is quite, quite high as far as those, those misspellings come in. And it also leads to one additional issue, which is one of the, one of a, a, a huge contributor to what I was talking about earlier with regards to your domain reputation is your bounce rate. If you have a high bounce rate, Google and Microsoft, that is a huge red flag to them, even corporate email systems. That's a huge red flag that dings your, your domain reputation to say, I mean, these people are just not good email senders. Therefore, like, I, I just don't really trust them. I'm going to send their emails to, you know, spam immediately or just quarantine them altogether. So uh, long winded question of, you know, do, do you see different, um, you know, rates of validation across different industries, whether it be B2B, B2C, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so I would say the biggest influencer is how aggressive you are with your email capture. If you have entry pops, exit pops, if you're asking for email in a more aggressive manner, you know, I understand the marketers stress, hey, listen, we paid to get them to the page, we gotta, we gotta convert them, we gotta get their data. If you have any of those features on your site, it could be substantially higher, 25, 30 plus, you know, percent. So I think it's really important to look at how aggressive are our email techniques. If we have any of those in place, I think it becomes a lot more prudent to have a real time validation tool and where your traffic's coming from. Are you getting a lot of search traffic, Facebook traffic, or are you working with, especially if you're working with affiliate networks or third parties? then yeah, you, you certainly want to be, you know, a little bit more careful with it. But really, it's the easiest thing to do. And, and Mike, the work that your team would do with them, that's really the hard stuff, right? Because it, it, it takes time to look at those numbers and reports and, and make changes to sequences and frequencies of contacts and creatives. Like, this should be the easy thing. Like, just set up your API. If it's good, mail to it. If it's not, you know, don't. This is really the easiest step in the whole process. The hard work 
to me really comes in on the back end with a lot of your tools to maintain that reputation. And uh, I would just say, just keep it simple, right? Like just make sure everything coming in there is good and, and don't, you know, it, if you're gonna do all the work with your tools, there's no sense not to make sure what's going in there is not good. Yeah, so, so that's, uh, I, I, I think that's a good segue into some additional techniques um, and tools that, that we can all be using uh, in our, in our um, you know, kind of lives as, as email marketers. And, and like you, you know, one, one of the things that I always like to, to look at is, hey, we're spending so much time and energy into the creative side of things creating the content, uh, building out, you know, nurture campaigns or drip campaigns or, you know, a, a, a coming up with ideas of how we can be different. But none of that really matters if we can't make it to the inbox. And he, here's a little bit of a scary stat uh, for everybody and not to use scare tactics, but only about 80 percent of today's commercial uh, email makes it to the inbox. Uh, or makes it close to the inbox. That means 80% of today's email, uh, commercial email is either going to the clutter folder, the promotions tab, or maybe the primary inbox. And to break that down even farther, that means one out of every five emails just gets either put in spam or quarantined altogether. So some things that you can really think about um, and, and do to, to improve your domain reputation, which is really what we're here to talk about, because that's ultimately what determines whether or not you're gonna be making it to the inbox, is the first of those being, you've really gotta to try to, at the very minimum, stay at or above your industry averages, uh, as far as open and click rates. I can't tell you how many customers come to me and say, we have a 10%, 5%, 15% open rate, even some that say I have 25% open rate, even 30%, and it's like, Flip this on its head. Why is 70 to 80 to 90 percent of the people that gave you their email address not engaging with you? If we were having a conversation, me and you, Matt, and you started tuning out and turning your head and, you know, paying attention and talking to somebody else, I wouldn't keep talking to you. But that's ultimately what happens in the world of email marketing, even though we have signals that people are tuning out. So at the very least, you that should be your first after you understand your domain reputation and the tools for monitoring and the tools for making sure that you're, you're getting clean data into your CRM is to say, hey, how do I get at or how do I stay above the my industry average? Um, and that, that's a conversation that needs to sometimes happen at the executive level. The second part of this is in some way, shape or form, you have to throttle email sending. Blasting emails, is from 2015 and before and i'm there's no quicker way to get yourself in trouble in in, in, in blasting out emails sending to whether it's 3,000 people 50,000 people 5 million people all at once there's too many problems that can happen one it's a huge red flag to uh to the email providers um especially if you have a company if you have any kind of a strategy and you don't have an email throttling strategy you need to stop right there because your email is just going to get flagged and quarantined by every corporate spam system that's out there uh, or every corporate uh, filtering system that's out there. Um, so throttle, throttling email sending has all kinds of benefits. And there are certain ways that you can do that out of almost every marketing automation platform that exists today. Um, and what throttling means is, hey, I'm going to slowly trickle out my email. Now there's more advanced ways of doing that and there's less advanced ways of doing that, but it's no longer blasting uh, in, in, in one single way. One thing I missed and I should have brought up earlier in the conversation is all about domain authentication. Um, and what this is, is a lot of email providers you can go sign up for today and just start sending email. But guess what happened? You go across uh, what's called a shared IP or a sh shared domain. And then what happens is you get associated with everybody else that's on that shared IP or that domain. And if you have bad actors, hey, you might even be a bad actor. You're going to get associated with everybody else. Whereas when you set up email authentication, um, this is stating to the internet that I take responsibility for my email. Um, and in fact, I think that's a step that should occur 
even before we look at email validation is making sure that your email authentication and that house is really in order. Um, and then the, the third thing, which this, these all kind of relate is, you know, keeping your list clean. Um, this will help you achieve, uh, you know, industry averages or significantly above, but cleaning your list is not all things are alike. Um, and I think this is another area that um, Tower Data does a phenomenal job of is some of the tools and techniques that you deliver behind this. Um, so Matt, why don't you, you kind of just dive in um, on, on that front, because I know we're running up on, uh, on time as well. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback on the uh, throttling technique. I mean, one thing that I think gets overlooked by senders is that as you're throttling, like what's your strategy for throttling? And one of the real good easy ways as you're throttling is to think of your emails as you're restarting an educational process about whatever you're selling or whatever you're trying to tell them because oftentimes as senders we get caught up in hey buy this purchase this book this and now buyers are more educated than ever so they're going to put your company in google they're going to put your software in google they're going to do their research they're going to look on social media so to me as you throttle, there should be a, a strategy to throttle. And maybe you're starting from scratch just saying, hey, I'm selling this product or service. Let me start by giving them some news or information and not trying to sell them and try to maybe educate them, build a little bit rapport with them, you know, provide some value in that email besides just maybe a coupon or discount code. And think about throttling as almost kind of starting from scratch and rebuilding that relationship just like you would with anyone else. I mean, if you lost touch with a friend, you haven't talked in a year or two, you know, a lot has gone on and you want to catch up with that person and, and thinking of how you're going to reposition yourself to that end user is important to start to, to re-engage them. And I found this actually pretty impressive. I did an example. I got a tree removed um, last winter by a local company. And I got an email from them, which really stood out to me actually two months ago. And then they're like, hey, here's everything you know, need to know about removing you know, trees in the spring, what you should be aware of. I'm like, this is a small company that's doing tree removals in, in my county. And I was like really impressed and it stood out. It wasn't just like, hey, do you have another tree we can knock down? And I took the time and I read it and I thought it was was pretty interesting. Obviously, I'm in the email space because it catches my eye, but it also caught my eye because it was, you know, a lot different and was informative. So I think that's something to pay attention to on how you reapproach kind of the uh, the throttling aspects. But one of the tools we we can help with on our end outside of validation is we also can help our clients understand the activity and open data around an email, which I think is important, really in kind of two applications. One, if you have a subset of users that you want to re-engage on a re-engagement campaign, or if you're a seasonal business, oftentimes you can go a while in between communications with your end users and validations, you know, a good tool for that. Um, but what we can do is essentially take a list of, let's say, 100,000 folks who purchased from you last year, and we can say, hey, maybe here are the 50 or 60,000 that just opened emails recently, and those would be the ones that we'd want to target. So from an activity standpoint, going back to open click rates and engagement, uh, that's another tool outside of validation for uh, legacy or seasonal data that's, that's really effective, and also just to see hey, if these people aren't opening my emails, are they opening elsewhere? You know, or are they just, you know, really hard to reach? So from an intelligence standpoint, outside of validation, you know, open and activity data can play a lot of different roles, both from a re-engagement standpoint, and then from an intelligence standpoint, just to see, you know, how active are those, those users, um, you know, out there, and, and are they really responding to others' emails? Awesome. Well, uh, let's would love to. Uh, I guess we're at the Q and A uh, point, but uh, excellent, excellent points there, Matt. Yeah, thank you guys. That is very enlightening, <laughs> especially as a marketer myself. I want to start out with this first question because I know I've been in a position where I've had to deal with this, um, and I want to see how you guys would approach it. 
So someone was asking, how do you navigate non-explicit opt-in email lists? So for example, if you're being pushed by higher ups and they're saying, okay, we bought this list, you have to use it. And you're sitting there biting your nails because you know deliverability may suffer. Um, how do you navigate having to use an email list like that? So Matt, I'll, I'll start um, addressing that question because it is something. Look, I, I, hey, we at Seven Cents we run a startup. Um, we I, I understand purchasing lists can be. A, 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 there's two sides of that coin. I fall in the middle. Um, it, it, as, as any growing business, it's got to be done, but it, it has to be done strategically. So one, you know, where are you getting the list from? What is the quality of that list? The first thing you should be doing is starting with a tool like Tower Data to do email validation. Is this email valid? Can I get some information about this email address before I start using my credit and my credit score to send these emails? So that would be the first point. The second point is that it is ultra critical that you, if you're purchasing lists that are not opted in, that you throttle those emails. Um, especially if you are on an enterprise class uh, marketing automation system. And what I mean by enterprise class, whether it be Salesforce, Marketing Cloud, Marketo, HubSpot, any of them, unless you're on a dedicated IP, they will shut you down like that. And the next thing you know, you, you won't even be able to send email as an organization anymore. Um, and by throttling, you can actually start to see, hey, what is the quality of this list not only from a bounce perspective, but are people actually engaging? Are they opening? Are they clicking? Are they going to our website? Are they taking that? Are they taking the action that we want them to take? Is it enough of them? And then we can course correct as time goes on. So that's the way that I would approach it is, um, the first step is to run it through an email uh, validation um, a tool like either Tower Data or XVerify, um, and then uh, make sure you have a throttling um strategy in place to deliver those to, to deliver emails to those uh to those lists sure so I, mike all, all good points what i would add is two things number one is you got to set internal expectations for that data you know oftentimes when higher ups they're looking at the bottom line and the number and then you have the email marketer saying hey how do i execute on this and we know third-party data is hard to execute on is it tempting yeah, um, but I think you have to set expectations for what you expect to get out of that data and when you expect to get out what you're expecting from that data. So I, I think that you want to taper the expectations, say, hey, this could be a smart, a, a, excuse me, a small part of our overall strategy, but certainly is not going to take us where we'd want to be as a company. So if you are taking in that third-party data, obviously, yeah, you, you want to validate it. And to your point, Mike, you do want to be cautious and slow in how you email it. But you also can't look at those folks like you look at anyone else on your email list. I mean, they really don't know anything about you. As much as you may think your brand is great and you're everywhere and everyone knows you, you can't assume that that person does because they would have probably came to your website and bought your stuff already. So I think taking an approach with those folks has to be different than everyone else on your list. And you have to educate them why you're reaching out, why you think you can help and not really ask for a sale or ask for too much of them right away and start to foster that relationship. And that goes to the point I was leading with that, you know, setting a realistic time frame to seeing a return on that because you can't, if you you know purchase 100,000 emails, can't load up and get 100,000 out that week. You know you may be working in you know a couple thousand a week or a couple hundred a day. And to Mike's point, you're going to have to really stay on top of your optimizations in terms of how you're sending and how frequently and are they opting out. So it is a long-term process, but I think if you set reasonable expectations for that and approach them in a different long-tail way, where you're educating and telling them why we're reaching out and why you think they can help, um, you know, it could be part of a, an overall email campaign. And Matt, I, I want to just add one point because you, you made an excellent, excellent point there with regards to setting internal expectations. 
I think that's one thing that most executives don't understand, which is, hey, we can just buy Discover Org access and then send out hundreds of thousands of emails. And this goes into what we, we talked about at the very onset of, of, of today, of today's conversation, which is most people still treat email as a commodity because they believe that it doesn't cost anything to send email. I already invested in this enterprise class marketing automation system. Why can't I just send more email? So th th there's two parts of that education that you need to have with the executive team, which is one, because we have a credit score. You know, it's, if I go borrow a million dollars from a bank and I spend all the money and I stop paying my, you know, stop paying my bill, I can't go borrow another million dollars. You know, put it put it in 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 their terms that they'll that they'll understand, which is why I use that credit score uh, reference all the time. Um, so setting that upfront expectation that hey, this could take this could be a really good part of our strategy, but it can't be our only strategy. Um, and we really do need to think about how we're going to get these emails delivered and what type of content we're going to ultimately deliver. Yeah, and I think one thing to mention too is that it's important to have the perspective. And I think sometimes marketers and organization, when they buy a list, it's so easy that they almost take for granted how they're going to approach that person compared to someone who you may have paid two dollars a click to get to your site and want to have ten convert. And you're looking at, hey, I paid 20 bucks, so you're going to approach them a different way. But you got to look at it. You have one chance to make an initial impression on this list that you purchased. So that first engagement, you can't be asking for too much. You're not going to have the opportunity to come back, them, come back to them with offer two, offer three, offer four. It's just not going to happen, right? Like if someone purchased, from your site, sure, you could do that. Hey, how about another 10% off, 20% off? Oh, I'll wait next week, maybe I'll get a 30% off coupon. That does work, and listen, we've all done it, we've all purchased that way, but if these are brand new folks, you, you have to be very mindful that you're gonna get that one initial opportunity, and if it isn't concise and you're not providing any value to them, you know, and, and be patient with that, solicitation process or sales process or communication process it's it's going to go south much quicker than folks on your internal opt-in list yeah well and speaking of things going south i have one final question that i want to ask both of you guys that came through um, that i found really interesting uh say you've already been blocked by uh your google or you've already been blocked your domain is blocked what is the best way to get unblocked you're already going south. How do you go back up? Um, first, you got to understand why why you got blocked. And I think you also have to look at, for the period of time you were getting deliverability, what were you doing and what changed? And I think Mike, Mike and his tools can probably speak in much more granular detail in terms of how that came to be. But I think those would be kind of two good starting points to understand, you know, why you're there and, and why you weren't before and try to identify really what that, you know, what changed in that period of time. So excellent point, Matt. And it, there's 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 really two pieces of it. And it's it's actually not very hard. Um, if you if you get into a bad reputation state with Google. Most of your emails is. is is going to spam. The first thing you need to do is you need to talk to your executive staff and coming back to expectations of, hey, I, like we know numerous B2C companies and even some B2B companies, which I, I, it, it honestly floors me that this is how some of marketers are gold. How many emails did you send this month? It's like, who gives a crap of how many emails I sent this month? Um, it, it, it's like, what was the quality of the email that I sent, and et cetera. So when you get into those types of situations, the first thing is you need to have a, an executive conversation that this is not like flip on, flip off the switch. We actually have to dig ourselves out of this. And then we also have to put a strategy in place so that we don't fall back into this. And digging yourself out of the hole is actually quite easy. You take the people that are the most engaged in your email program and you send to them for the next two months or the next month, month and a half. 
And then you start trickling back in the folks that are more called passive in your email program. And then maybe you start trickling in people that are more inactive in your email program. And you get yourself, you'll start to see yourself really climb out of that hole with Google. And you can climb out of the hole actually quite quickly, you know, two, three, four weeks time, depending on what your volume of email sending is. We've seen it happen as quickly as a week. Um, if you really just start focusing on sending much, much smarter. And what you'll actually find, and we have seen this time and time and time again, people that have either a bad or a low reputation with Google, if they can get back into that medium or high reputation, they may send significantly less email to significantly less people but the number of physical opens, clicks, and purchases they get is significantly higher, even though they're sending to far less people. So it's counterintuitive to the way a lot of executives think. Now, if you are in those situations and you use, I'll give a shameless plug, you use HubSpot or Marketo, please feel free to reach out and we can show you how you can do it very, very simply. Yeah, there are a lot of questions that are still here that are asking about specific services that you recommend or if they're getting specific results, how to sort of consolidate those with what HubSpot's saying, et cetera. So I think we're going to end it there because that was the majority of the general questions. Um, but if you did leave a question, either Matt or Mike will follow up with you individually. You'll get an email from them answering it, um, again, because the majority of those are about 7 cents or tower data. Um, but I wanted to say thank you, Matt and Mike. This has been great. I'm so excited to have all this knowledge about email deliverability. Um, and we're going to follow up with everyone, whether you were able to attend. If you registered, you'll get the full recording of this, as I mentioned before. If you asked a question, you'll get your follow up. And then there will be an email with some resources available about deliverability from Seventh Sense and Tower Data. But thank you guys so much. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Thanks, Matt. Really enjoyed the conversation. And again, thanks everybody for uh, for attending. Hopefully you got a little bit out of it. And uh, please don't hesitate in reaching out if there's anything we can do.